be with you. This morning, the gospel account is really an elaborate story of rescue. We will discover the object of the rescue operation, who the rescuer is, and from what the object of the rescue operation is being rescued. In other words, hope is fulfilled yet again in Jesus. These are the things that we'll be pondering this morning in our hearts and minds. We do have at least two birthdays of which we are aware. On February the 5th, Wes Hartz is having a birthday. And on February 7th, George Walter is having a birthday. Now, are they here? I'm not sure Wes is. Is George? Hello, George. Happy birthday. I bet it feels good to be 29 again, right? Let's sing happy birthday loudly, please. Happy birthday. Are there any anniversaries? Okay. Well, let's take a moment to greet each other in the Lord's name. If you're comfortable, please uh, look at the camera and wave. Let's stand as we do all that. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in our opening hymn. Please be seated. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. 
O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. My friends in Christ, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as we sing the hymn of praise. Please be seated. <clears throat> In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. 
for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith, that relying on the hope of your heavenly grace, we may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear God's word. The reading, first reading is from the Old Testament reading from Isaiah, chapter 58. Why have we fasted, and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure, and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel, and to fight, and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. 
The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth shall pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join together in the sermon hymn. Grace, mercy, and God's peace be unto you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. The gospel is the text this morning. Please be seated. So, this morning is one of my favorite Sundays because, and let me find it here, the, yes, so, Jesus, the, the way the reading for the gospel is chosen has been in practice in the church for hundreds of years. We have what's called the pericable system, which is 
the readings that are chosen, and they've been chosen over time by the church. And we use a three-year series, series A, B, and C. We use series A this year. And they kind of spread themselves through the entire Bible so that there's at least a little bit of learning going on. But this morning is one of those situations where the gospel ends, and then we have the familiar, this is the gospel of the Lord. But it ends on kind of a law note. For I tell you, Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then we say, this is the gospel of the Lord. Can you see the irony? Laugh with me. That's just so bizarre. I always laugh at that. So let's, exp- let's take some time to unpack all of this because this morning's gospel hits every last one of us because every last one of us either has broken some, maybe even all of the commandments, or we know someone who has broken some if not all of the commandments. So in one sense, this morning, you're going to take things personally. You're going to take the law personally because it's about you. It's about me. But then you're going to take the gospel, the words of Jesus' forgiveness for you, you're going to take those personally too. So let's get into this. Jesus said and did many things that fulfilled the law. In fact, he did say that he had come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And that anyone who relaxed even the slightest commandment in the law and taught others to do so would be called least in the kingdom of God. Here's the thing about the Ten Commandments. You can't negotiate or compromise them. And you dare not toy with them. For example, did God really say? Or the ever popular, well, that was for a different age. It doesn't really apply to us today. It will accuse you. It will amplify and magnify your sin. And it will kill you. Period. You've heard it said, but I say to you. You know those passages. With those words, Jesus, wait a minute, Jesus interprets the law on the basis of his own authority. Rabbis in those days would appeal to authority that went before them. They they would say, this rabbi said this, this rabbi said that. Jesus is the rabbi of all rabbis, the one who wrote the law with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, And so he gets to interpret them on his own authority. Never mind what all the teachers of old said. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. He doesn't need those, what's the word, blasted footnotes, references, or credentials, or some pages-long bibliography of citations, uh, from which he cited, I should say. He's the Lord, it's his law. And he can apply it any way he chooses. And so what he chooses to do is amplify the law. Turn its volume way, way up. Almost to distortion levels. Those of us of a certain age, we remember the stereo systems we had. And they went from 1 to 10. And if you were lucky, maybe you got an amp that had an 11 on it. There's a movie about that, but we're not going to get into that. He amplifies it. He moves from action, not just talking about it, but attitude from outward compliance to inner attitude, from orientation to God and neighbor to the orientation of the, wait for it, the heart. In each instance, Jesus goes from the outward sin to the inward sinfulness, from the symptom to the underlying disease. The problem is not simply that we do bad things, my friends in Christ, but that we are corrupted by sin so that every thought, word, and deed 
no matter how good they appear, no matter how much it serves the neighbor, is still, in fact, tainted by sin. Sin is like a malicious virus that has invaded the hardware and the software of our humanity to the extent that we cannot not sin. So why would Jesus, the gospel, God in the flesh, why would he choose to do that? Jesus preaches the law this way in order to drive the old religious Adam and Eve to utter despair. Jesus says elsewhere, you've heard it said, do not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And you're right now thinking to yourself, and so am I. Well, I'm on, off the hook on that one. I haven't strangled, stabbed, shot, or even kicked anyone in the shins. At least not since that playground fight back in grammar or grade school. I'm pretty kind most of the time to people. And I always help little old ladies cross the street and would never harm anyone. But guess what? Jesus comes along with his, but I say to you, and he says, but I say to you, and everyone who is angry, yes, angry, with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the counselor, and whoever says you fool, fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, you know that little altercation you had in the Walmart shopping cart uh, lot? Or that flash of road rage at the guy who cut you off on, the, uh, on Circle Drive? Or that simmering anger you're nursing still gets you convicted of murder in God's court? Do you feel the amplification yet? And if Jesus hadn't become the murderer in your place, the hell of fire would be yours. But Barabbas the murderer goes free as Jesus goes to his innocent death. Now you're wondering, Rudy, are you ever going to get to the salt and the light? I'm just going to, spoiler alert, probably not today. How many times have you heard that one? Your whole life. Let's get into the weeds of this text, shall we? Jesus says elsewhere, do not commit adultery. And immediately think, oh, I've got that one covered. I'm faithful in my marriage. I never stray. I always come home on time. I promise to fulfill my vows to my spouse and treat them, for example, the way that Ephesians 5 um, teaches us to treat each other in our marriages. In those days, adultery, you could stone someone to death. Almost every man in the crowd who heard Jesus that they thought he was pretty much immune from the law. They were the kind of people who stoned adulterers. There was no way any of them were guilty of adultery. I mean, you need to be reminded that Jesus, of course, never married. Doesn't matter what rumors you've heard. The fact is, he never got married. But Jesus became sin for us in the totality of our sinfulness. <coughs> he became the faithless, divorcing spouse or the one who failed to live up to the vows in their marriage. He took up our faithlessness, our unwillingness to forgive, our selfishness, all that drives a wedge between a husband and a wife. He became one flesh with his bride, the church. He forgives and sustains her even when she is faithless and adulterous. He refuses to divorce his church even when she might deserve it. He does it to rescue us from our adulteries, our divorces, all the ways we have taken the gift of marriage 
and used it for our own self-centered purposes. This is the deeper diagnosis, the one that we don't want to hear. Sin isn't superficial and topical. It's deep and it's total. That's how profound this is. It's not just a matter of, I don't know, a bad word here, a bad thought there, and a bad action now and then. Forget it. Sin hurts because it's a deeply corrupted orientation of the heart. It's not simply murder, but anger and hatred. Not simply adultery, but lust in the heart. Not simply little white lies, but a darkness of untruth. Not just some little failures to live up to vows, but a complete abject lack therein. And we don't willingly want to hear any of this. You didn't come to church this morning to hear this, did you? No one left feeling justified about himself that day. No one left thinking, hey, I'm doing pretty well here. God may and must be pleased with me. Because here's the thing. To play games with the law is to play games with the life and suffering and death of Jesus who came to fulfill the law. When we try to justify ourselves or explain away what we've done or sins, and by the way, remember that sins are of commission and omission. The things that you do and the things that you fail to do. People try to justify both the things they've done and the things they've left undone. When we justify ourselves, even when our, in our minds we believe we are right and good, we are saying in effect, I don't need Jesus in that part of my life. When we boast about our good works or when we make excuses or rationalizations or justifications for our own sin, we're saying in so many words, Jesus, death, and resurrection doesn't apply here. Now let me read something and then I'm going to unpack it. Every loophole in the law, every erased iota or dot or chit or tittle, every self-justification takes away something from the cross that Jesus died on. Now you're probably wondering, maybe not, but let me help you wonder, <laughs> um, what Jesus means by every little dot or iota. And I'm going to insert the word tittle. Because when you look at, and I, I should have put this in the, on the screen for you to see. Someday I'll do it. When you read Hebrew, which reads right to left, in the original Hebrew text, there are no vowels. There's no vowels written. So along come some Masoretic Jewish rabbis. I don't have time to get into who they were. But they decided in order to have a consistent pronunciation throughout Hebrew language, we need to put in vowel pointing. And there are little marks, usually a little dot, that help you distinguish words that are spelled the same but pronounced differently. Because who wants to do that? And they became to be known as Iotas, sometimes they look like an apostrophe. So there's an iota, um, which is also, I should say, that's a letter in the Greek, but that's the story for another day. So jots and tittles are the little marks in the Hebrew text that show you where the vowels are. The iota is the Greek equivalent in the Greek language. Now without those, you mispronounce words, you you have words that are spelled the same but pronounced differently, and that, of course, can have an impact on what's written there. And then when you say it, it can change the meaning of the text. And Jesus is saying, don't you dare think you can change any part of these words because every little jot and tittle and iota is important. You can't change those, because if you change those, you change the meaning. So don't mess with the text. It's hyperbole. 
exaggerated form of expression to highlight just how important this is. Okay, enough of that. He came to become our sin, so every loophole in the law, every erased iota or jot or tittle, every self-justification takes something away from the death of Jesus on the cross. Now you know what he's talking about. He, became, he came to become our sin for us, not help us progress in our moral improvement program. The church is not a moral improvement program. Step by step. It's not. If you want that, check out the Saskatoon Leisure Guide. There's all kinds of self-help. Or go to the, the library or the bookstore and go to the self-help section. You can get all that there. We're not here for that. Those agencies can do that way better than we can. We're not in that business. The business we're in is preaching, as you heard this morning, Christ and him crucified for the forgiveness of sins. That message you won't get anywhere else. The way to hear the law is not to find ways that it doesn't apply to you, but to recognize how it all applies to you. You are the murderer. I am the murderer. I am the adulterer. You are the adulterer. You are the guilty part in the divorce. You are the guilty one who failed to live up to the vows in your marriage. You are the liar and so am I. I am the murderer, the adulterer, the guilty party in the divorce, the liar. I in myself have no righteousness, no holiness, no innocence, no claim to make before God, and neither do you. But here's the thing. Remember I said you'd take it personally? You might be weeping inside this morning. But here's where you should be leaping for joy inside this morning. Christ became sin for you, that in him you might be and become the righteousness of God. Let me say it again. Christ became sin for you, in order that you might be and become the righteousness of Jesus inside of you because of the cross of Christ. He died and rose that you might live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Christ is the end of the law for all who believe. He didn't just preach the law, he did the law, and he died under the law to rescue you from every commandment, every iota, every dot that would condemn you. So, when the Doberman of the law comes after you, I want to invite you in the gospel to hide behind the lamb who was slain and lives. That lamb, after all, has covered you in his blood. Amen. And now the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in him forever. Amen. Let's stand as we sing the hymn in response.
Please be seated. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, musical offertory. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you delight to loose the bonds of wickedness and to undo the straps of the heavy yoke, that freed from sin's bondage we may gladly receive your blessings. Preserve us from the lie that you are a cruel oppressor and give us thankful hearts to rejoice that you are the giver of all good gifts. Lord, in your mercy, merciful God, preserve your church by your life-giving word. Open the lifts of pastors to declare your just degree, decrees and store them up in the hearts of your people that we may delight in your promises and abound in good works. Lord, in your mercy, for an end to wars, especially the end to the war in Ukraine, and to the end of violence. 
for the service men and women who preserve the peace, for our government and those who lead us, and for the cause of justice among the nations and all those oppressed, we pray. Lord, have mercy. Holy Father, cause healing to spring up speedily for the sake of your Son. Have mercy upon those who suffer afflictions of any kind in their bodies. Especially we here bring before you your servants Patty Pfeiffer and Norm Bucher. Preserve your people in faith until the day when your light breaks forth like the dawn. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, send forth your Holy Spirit that delivered from the spirit of this world we may hold fast in faith to what you freely give us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father. Please stand. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We join together in our closing hymn. may be seated. So we wanted to say thank you to everyone who came this morning to worship and to those who have taken the time to watch the video as well. We invite you to read through the bulletin to find the information you need. 
However, I do have two very brief announcements. First of all, we hope you'll be able to stay for our annual meeting. It will take about 10 minutes to set up tables and microphones. At this time, you might, of course, be wanting to use the washroom or visit with uh, each other. Please consider putting your name on the riders or drivers lists uh, with regard to the Lenten services. Our Ash Wednesday service will be held on February 22nd at 10 a.m. We will need to know how many people plan to attend the pancake and sausage lunch that will follow the service that morning. That will help the gentlemen of the congregation purchase and prepare the meal. And then um, I wanted to just bring to your attention the poster that's on the door and the sign-up sheet for the next luncheon. Um, we're going to show and feature the Ukra sorry, Ukraine, a little bit of a travelogue and I believe a meal that will accompany that as well. It's all Ukraine themed. So that's coming up, I believe, the 16th of February. Is that the right date, Renata? Yep. Okay, oh, there, oh, there. yes. February 16th, uh, 12 noon. Okay, and there is a sign-up sheet. And then lastly, if you uh, know that you'll be attending, please put your name on that list. Please put your name on the list if you're attending the Pancake and Sausage Luncheon. Um, we'll need to know all of that for the luncheon on the 19th. When's the deadline for this um, Ukraine? It'll be before the 16th. It'll be like the 12th. Or the 12th, let's say the 12th. Um, also, what I'm going to do now is instead of greeting you, I'm going to go back, to change into my civilian clothing, as it were, and um, then I'll join you for the annual meeting. Who are we following out? We're following Dell this morning. Or Del, Moira, okay. Del or Moira, as you leave this morning, go in peace.